so there's going to be a test at the end. Um, see if I can get as much applause after the talk as I got for, for starting it. So this is perhaps the easiest submission I've had to a conference. I said, I can do a talk about testing in OpenStack, and they said yes. <laughs> <laughs> then I had to figure out what I was going to talk about. So I don't actually work directly on the stuff I'm going to talk about. That's, that's a caveat. I still think I'll be able to give you an interesting tour of some stuff, and hopefully some of you folk will be able to go and run this yourself and find it useful. So this is the sort of high-level view everyone talks about with OpenStack, and it is a complete lie. And it's a complete lie for reasonably good reasons. But this is what I actually work on, which is triple I. So I work on making OpenStack deployable. Um, there's, there's dozens of individual services that need to be run across a significantly large number of machines if you're doing anything more complex than a kind of toy install. And it drives people spare. So we're trying to make that really a lot better. And we're trying to do that by deploying on top of OpenStack itself. Does anyone here not know what OpenStack is? You don't count. OK, there's enough people. So OpenStack is an implementation of a cloud. So AWS uh, or Azure are clouds you can ask via a RESTful API for a machine, and you get a machine back. You can ask for a file to be stored, and you can retrieve that back at the, at the URL later. Uh, it's the very <coughs> minimum definition of a cloud. And OpenStack is a, a very comprehensive open source implementation of those APIs. And it builds on top of things like OpenVSwitch and KVM or Zen Server to perform the actual operations that have been done. So it's almost entirely in Python. Most of it's not performance sensitive until you run at scale, and unfortunately people run this stuff at scale. <laughs> and this is what they actually end up running. <laughs> now, this is the simple version of the diagram. <laughs> I'm, I am serious. This is, I think, now a year old, and um, there's been at least two more project splits since that was done, plus additional projects coming in as people want to add capabilities that weren't there in the early days. But the main reason I'm showing this is to highlight that there is, a, from a testing perspective, there's an awfully large amount of complexity. If you think about writing a unit test for one of these things, you're almost certainly going to be dealing with a pluggable interface that can have multiple different back ends. And so you're going to have abstractions on abstractions and abstractions. Almost all of these services talk across each other. Nova talks to Glance, Glance talks to Keystone. You're not in an isolated environment, so a unit test is, mo is going to be mocking out most of what goes on. So from a quality perspective, unit tests, they help you catch very coarse problems, but they don't stop you having lots and lots and lots of things propagate through and cause actual serious grief. So I, I mainly look at this diagram and go, I have to deploy that. But from a coding perspective, you all write good code, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, it, it never fails? Never. never. Right. <laughs> so the problem is that this is a big stinking lie. <laughs> and it's not a lie on an individual basis. I can write a patch, I can test it locally, I can do some integration tests, and I can test it on a local deployed cloud, and I can be fairly confident it works. But it's going to have maybe, say it's got a 1% chance of failure. If you start throwing hundreds of these patches forward, that 1% chance of failure becomes a dead certainty. And uh, yeah, the actual statistics is it, it, no. Most patches that are pushed up don't have a 1% chance of failure. They've got a much higher chance of failure. And here's a nasty thing. Once you get a patch working, if you just leave it there, not merged into trunk, and other people keep working and improving the system, your patch will then break. So not only is untested code broken code, unmerged code is broken code. So how do you get code into a trunk? You, you, you do code review, right? Everyone loves code review. Quick question, who here has used Jarrett or, or similar sorts of systems? OK, I, I won't bore you with... with um, I keep looking back because I've managed to set my screen up so I can't see what's on the screen behind me. Um, this is a wonderful graph. 
So this is the, um, so OpenStack uses Jarrett for its code review system. And Jarrett is a Git-based code review system that lets a lot of people collaborate and have a discussion about a patch. These three lines here, the blue lines, are the number of comments per day. And the scale on the left is correct. This is thousands being left in the OpenStack code review system about patches going through it. So you can see the peak periods in the middle of the cycle, there were nearly 6,000 comments a day being added to the system. The yellow line, oh, it's, it's yellow to me, I'm red, green, color blind. If that's purple, I'm sorry. The yellow line is the number of patches that have been put into the system, and this includes updates to existing patches. And you can see that on a quiet day, that might be as low as, I don't know, 100 patches to the projects as a whole. But on a busy day, uh, what, nearly 1,500 patches put up. And we were talking about how you get a patch through and how your code's broken. So the way I want to frame it in this discussion is to say that's 1,500 new bugs being put forward. And we have to figure out which of them are really bugs, which of them aren't. The actual, I think it is a purple line down the bottom, is when changes are merged. So that's the number of things that went through all of the gates, unit testing, functional testing, reviewer agrees it's okay. In fact, two reviewers agree that it's an okay thing to do. And yeah, there is quite a big gap between the amount of things proposed and the amount of things that get through. And so when you're looking at OpenStack testing, you're looking at, at that gap. And the one thing I really want to call out here is reviewers don't scale, right? If there's a, a recent study, IBM, I think IBM put it up on their website about code review and how effective people can be and how long it takes to do code review. And you're looking at the number of defects you stop from ever entering your system where you pick them up in code review. It's actually really hard to do good code review. People become noticeably bad at it if they spend more than about half an hour doing it in a row. And it's a non-linear thing. If you have a big patch, people find less bugs per line of code in the patch, in a big patch, than if they review a small patch. And I don't know how many people have looked at how well big patches work when they land in a tree, but actually the data says that the relationship should go the other way around. In a big patch, you should be finding more bugs per line of code. So what we do is we run the full unit test suite, integration suite, and functional suite for every single patch, every time it's updated. We don't run it when we put it into trunk. We run it when it gets updated. Separately, when it goes into trunk, we run it the proposed combination of trunk plus that patch across everything. But this means that if you look at the number of changes, when we go back to this graph here, the number of changes that merged, what, is there a number near 1,000? No. So 500 merged on that day there. That doesn't represent, that represents 500 test runs of the things as they merge, plus another 1,500 test runs being done for the things that were put forward and hadn't actually gone through. Uh, so automated testing, yeah, it's a wonderful thing. I should apologize, this talk really isn't about Python. I wish it was, but it, it's about a project that uses Python. However, the talk itself is going to go off the, off the rails when we get further in. So the important things for me in, in terms of automated testing is it's re reliable and repeatable. If it's not reliable, people will switch it off. And once it's switched off, you lose all of the benefits from it. And if it's not repeatable, by repeatable I mean I can run it and you can run it. Not that I can run it twice. It's got to be shareable and consumable. I've got to be able to reproduce the environment myself. If I can't reproduce the environment, I can't duplicate the problem, and that means I can't fix it. Or I have to fix it by hands-off debugging, which is really not fun. And we've got a scale problem here, because um, I think I've got it on the next slide. Yes. Um, this is a thing called Zool. Well, this is a status page for a thing called Zool. A thing called Zool is actually a whole bunch of Python code, which is nowhere near as pretty as this. What you see here is a single change set proposed to heat. So the, the number beside the name is the change set, and the comma four means it's the fourth iteration of that change set, the fourth time they've tried to get it to work. 
Um, the, this queue here, the middle one, is the gate, which when things go through that, they actually go into trunk. They become part of the project. The, the check queue on the left is where they're checked before reviewers look at them. Reviewers won't look at things that haven't been checked because they'll assume that they're going to be broken and that any review they did would be wasted. And um, each of these rows within this box is a separate test run, not all testing the same stuff. So the first one is, does PEP8 complain about this code? The docs one is do the docs build. But the Python 2.6 and Python 2.7 run the same test suite, but under different versions of Python. OpenStack as a project supports Python 2.6 and Python 2.7. So we want to make sure that we don't break in either environment. Fairly straightforward stuff, right? And we're starting to bring in Python 3.2 and 3.3 test jobs as well, um, starting on the client libraries and working out. It's a, fairly deep stack we've got, so it's going to take a while to, to work across it. But these ones are the really interesting things, right? Notice the progress bar. 21 minutes is how long it's expecting this thing to, to reach full. So we've got one and a half thousand of these boxes a day, and each one is going to take uh, about half an hour to run through. That's well, I, I can't make that fit in a day, right? So we've got to be doing a whole bunch of work in parallel for this to, to work at all. And one immediate answer people may be thinking is Jenkins. Jenkins can run stuff in parallel. It can. And these are actually backed on Jenkins. Um, I should mention this dev stack thing, Tempest dev stack. Tempest is a, a test runner that runs tests against a live cloud. DevStack is a development version of OpenStack, so it's install everything on one machine. You don't want to use it again afterwards. Um, install everything on one machine and configure it so it's got a working cloud there. You can then make API requests to, and it'll run stuff in QEMU, so you can actually see whether it's working. Um, part of the reason that this is quite a slow thing is that DevStack in a cloud, it's running as a VM in a cloud, has to run nested QEMU. So, sorry, it can't run this to KVM, it has to run QEMU. And that means that the actual VMs you spawn are slow. And so it takes longer than it would on real hardware. If we could get a cloud provider, and I know I work for one, I'm sorry. But if we could get a cloud provider to turn on uh, nested KVM, then we could make that quite a bit faster. Where do you run these tests? In the cloud. Which, uh, which provider? Um, they, they are run on both the open... They run on both the Rackspace cloud and the HP cloud services cloud. So those two companies pay for the testing? Those two companies contribute several different accounts, uh, separation of concerns, several different accounts for OpenStack infra to use to run tests, and they have a fairly large quota set to them. I think we run 60-odd machines concurrently, 8 gig instances. So there's a, that's a reasonable number of cores and, and reserve space. If you're running this infrastructure yourself, you probably wouldn't want that many instances running, unless you've got a problem that, that matches it, and we'll get to that later on in it. So this is a full, this is when that, you know, when that thing's finished. These are the, the key figures I'm, I'm calling out there. You're looking at um, half an hour, more or less. A little bit less. It used to be significantly longer, but we got parallelization built into Tempest now. So um, test repository strikes again, yay. We now run the tests in parallel. That means the, div the test cloud is put under more stress because you're doing concurrent API requests to it from different test workers. And so we had to move to larger machines to support that. But on the other side, we, we cut 25 minutes off it in the first iteration. And sort of down the track, we're now sort of saying, how can we go to a, a, you know, multiple machines and spread this out even more? So drive that number down, trade off uh, latency versus, versus, like keep the same number of total machines running tests, but if we can make everything run twice as fast and use twice as many machines while it runs, we'll get better responsiveness back to the developers who are submitting patches and the reviewers who are, who are reviewing patches. Um, Right, so this is the thing I actually really want to be able to stand up and talk to you and say, hey, this is a fantastic thing, let's really go and do it. 
use what's been built to run that entire environment. So I was kind of putting together, you know, who'd want to use this? So if you're in a small environment and you've got a unit test that takes 20 seconds to run, you probably don't need a scalable test infrastructure. But you might want reusable test infrastructure. So you may still want to go down this path. But most projects, particularly web projects, are going to have functional tests, and functional tests can get quite slow quite quickly, um, whether you're a command line tool or a website. Um, if you've got things like Selenium involved, you'll get very slow very quickly. Um, probably won't have anything quite as nasty as Tempest to deal with, but uh, you know, maybe you do. But you also need some things. Your source code, to reuse this infrastructure I've been talking about, your source code has to be in Git. And you have to have access to an OpenStack cloud. Fortunately, OpenStack is an open source project, so you can deploy a cloud yourself if you don't have access to one. Or you could use a, a, um, a cloud on the web. However, the number of machines needed to do this is non-trivial, and cloud providers are out to make a profit, so that they may charge you. Um, one interesting thing is that you do need um, some sort of SSO. Open ID is preferred because one of the things for me is being able to reuse this infrastructure other people are putting together and not have to think about it. To be able to just say, hey, that sounds like a great thing, turn it on, and away you go. Um, problem is, it's not that yet. So it's a moving target at the moment in two ways. One is that I've had to do a lot of copy and paste to get the, my example site up and running. So every time they change those files, I'm going to have to go and re-audit the, the delta I have and make sure it applies and carry it across. Now, I intend to be pushing on this further and going towards parameterization so that we, I can be reusing the exact same infrastructure definitions but just changing the, the host names and the security keys. Um, that's not where I'm at today. I end up spending the last two weeks getting to the point where I have a working infrastructure. So I know that you can clone this infrastructure. Um, and where is my slide? Right. So that URL is the URL for documentation for running the OpenStack infrastructure at home or in your office or whatever. Um, it's the result of, see all those patches up there? Those are mainly documentation patches about how to do this. As I found things that weren't documented, waited around until someone who knew could answer my question about how it was in production, because I have no access to the production site. I couldn't see the actual configuration, the secrets that were running, or the log files, where, they, where people were looking at. So this is half of the patches that I did to build the URL I gave you. The other half have landed already, and these ones, when they land, will go into that, that file and give you a much more comprehensive overview of what's going on. Um, now, I've actually got 10 minutes left, so I'm going to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so the basics, um, actually I should ask, are you, do you guys want to hear about the mechanics of bringing up that sort of site, or would you like to hear more about the, the plumbing that's in the site itself and how it hangs together and the war stories like Jenkins scalability problems and so on? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, war stories, raise your hands. Okay, put your hands down. Infrastructure, how to do it, raise your hands. Right, well you guys are lucky because I've got slides for you. <laughs> but what I'll, do, I'll do both, I'll do both. Right? So um, you do this, and you, you had time to read that one, so, and, and you do this. Um, the main thing to be aware of is that it's Puppet based, and if you, uh, if you don't love Puppet, that may be a bit of a, a culture shock. The, the aspiration that the folk who run this infrastructure have is that it should be easy and straightforward to reuse, but their priority is delivering the infrastructure for a project that is doubling its developer base on a ridiculous basis. The last summit that was held for OpenStack had 2,000 attendees. That was five months ago, more or less. The next one in Hong Kong got projecting 5,000 attendees for the development summit. This is lots. <laughs> There's a thousand contributors who have contributed a patch and had it land, not put it up on the site and had it ignored, but who have actually had it land into a trunk, one of the project's trunks. A thousand in the last six months. So um, 
Um, and and th that number's a bit out of date. It may have gone, gone upwards. So it's a very, very busy project. And that's why this testing load exists. So in terms of war stories, the testing load, um, I'm wondering whether I should bring up some stuff from the live site to point, but I think I'll just talk to it. One of the standard configurations you'll find for running tests is you grab Jenkins, you configure a job in there, and you pull stuff out of trunk and you run it and it reports back and says, hey, yeah, this worked. Great. So the first, that, that has a problem. You're now landing code, hoping it works, and it's telling you whether you made a mistake or not. And you really want it to be the other way around. You want to put some code forward, have it de determine that it works for you, and then land it, which is what this system does. So the way this system does it is that Jarrett, the code review system, is able to submit the code. It also acts as a Git repository. So it holds the master copy of all your code. And when you say, this is ready to land, it does the merge for you. So there's a thing called Zool. Yes, you can figure where they got the name from, which will speculatively merge and test. So it goes to Jenkins. It creates a merged copy of trunk plus that patch, commits that just to a private location, and hands that off to Jenkins and says, Jenkins, please run this, this temporary commit and make sure it works. And when it gets a message back saying it worked, then it pushes that back up into Jarrett, but pushes it directly onto the master repository. So that becomes your commit. Bang, it went in. One of the nice things that Zool does is, it, because it's a scheduler, it can take, f so, say you've got 10 patches all approved and you've got a one hour test suite, which, you know, large websites, not that uncommon. It will run all 10 in parallel for you one after another. So it will run the first one with trunk plus that commit. The next one, and the ordering is temporal, like I clicked on this button, then I clicked on that button. The, the second one, it will run with the first one's merge plus the next one merged in. So it's not running both of them individually merged to trunk, it's running one on its own with trunk and the next one with the first one and then the third one with the previous two. So you're getting the union of all this stuff. So cross-patch problems are shown up and it runs them all in parallel using the cloud. So you find out about, um, say, say you had 10 patches and the fifth one fails. It acts like a CPU pipeline. It throws away the result from that point on and then recalculates it. So it will try the sixth one on top of the fourth and the seventh on top of the fourth plus sixth and so on, just dropping the fifth one out and regenerating the pipeline and submitting it back into the test environment. Now the test environment is Jenkins. And this is where some of the scaling stuff really starts to, to get nasty. So with enough jobs running, there are uh, mutexes which are apparently quite hard to, to separate out inside Jenkins that control both submitting work to slaves and copying files off slaves. So when you have enough slaves, like 60, 80, 100, and you're busy copying log files from your test runoff, and you're also trying to submit jobs onto a slave, well, the net result can be that you don't actually use all your slaves because you're too busy inside this one mutex in the Jenkins core. So OpenStack actually runs three separate Jenkins masters. Now, they're all identical. It's just they're keeping the, the number of slaves down to a manageable amount per Jenkins so they don't hit the scaling bug. Um, the number of slaves that are running, there's, there's two sets of slaves that they configure. One is manually configured, they run it up by hand, they register it with one of the Jenkins, they're looking at moving away from that. The other one is a thing called node pull. So oh, one thing I should note, this is reasonably well engineered, so this, these projects, Zool, Jarrett, node pull, are all separate projects, they can be reused independently. Um, node pull is a thing that will spin up a slave and configure it as a Jenkins slave, and then just hold it there. When you've used it, sometimes you can reuse a slave, other times you do destructive things to the test environment, and so it will spin up, it will spin them up in advance of your projected load. So if it sees you working through, you know, 100 tests an hour, and that actually means that you throw away a slave after 10 test runs, it, will, it might hold two slaves in reserve for you. Um, what else is there that I haven't mentioned? Jenkins Job Builder, again, this is a scale thing. Jenkins Job Builder takes YAML files that describe what actions to take during a test run, both where to schedule it, 
how to schedule it, what shell script commands to run, to check stuff out of Git. And it combines multiple such YAML files into a Jenkins job definition. And the benefit of doing that is that if you have a lot of jobs that are all fundamentally the same, you don't want to be going into the Jenkins UI and going click, 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 click across hundreds of jobs when you have a definition change to your, your basic infrastructure, like where is your Git repository stored or where do you report results to. Um, Jenkins Job Builder is very useful at small scale because it's a much clearer view on your job than going into a complex web UI. You can look at it with a text editor, you can version control it, and the way it works is it does this compilation and then it uses the Jenkins um, RESTful API to write everything up to it. 